Right, Gary. We're going to continue looking at uh, Macbeth, obviously. At the end of the last not the session I did, um, we'd reached a stage at the end of Act 1, Scene 4 of the play. If you recall, Act 1, Scene 1, we have witches making their predictions, uh, setting up very much the themes, but also the narrative, what's going to happen in the play. Um, Act 1, Scene 2, we're introduced to the protagonist, the main character of the play, Macbeth. Okay, and if you recall, he's illustrated there to be, he's shown there to be uh, somebody who was almost heroic in tendency, rather than a villain. And obviously it's the nature of villainy that we're looking at here. Um, and those traits that he shows are things like bravery, uh, he is a skillful fighter. Um, but above all, and the most important thematic thing, the most important thing that we know about him is, is that he disdains fortune. He can almost make his own path. He can determine what's going to happen to him. And we know that comes into conflict with what the witches have said in the previous scene. Um, then we actually come to the idea of how we start exploring the idea of fate impacting on Macbeth. And the, the witches, if you recall when he's uh, moving away from the battle with Banquo, the witches first of all greet him as Thane of Glams, which he is, then of Thane of Cawdor, which he is not, and then finally as King. She clearly is not, because King Duncan is still alive. And then missives, then messengers from the king arrive, and they tell him that the traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, is going to be executed, and what was Cawdor's title is now going to Macbeth. And as we said last time, that plants that seed of doubt in, or sorry, seed of ambition, rather, in Macbeth's mind. Okay? And his, his companion, Banquo, notices this. He's looked, he's wrapped with awe. And Macbeth actually, in his asides, those little things he says to himself, is very, very clearly tempted by the prospect, well, if I've been made Thane of Cawdor, is there some potential that fate will make me king? Or have I got to do things myself in order to make that happen? Okay? And that's sort of where we are. If you remember, at the end of Act 1, Scene 4, Macbeth, and this is a narrative, a plot device that Shakespeare uses, rather than actually just going straight to his castle and telling his wife, because he is with King Duncan, and King Duncan has said, I'm going to make it known to everybody that my son Malcolm is next in line to the throne, and after that my other son Donald Bain. Um, Macbeth sends a messenger with a letter to his wife, telling her exactly what has happened. Okay, and that's where we are at the beginning of Act 1, Scene 5, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. There were a couple of sort of contextual things, so background things. Just let me check we're still recording, and our memory card is, is working. There's a couple of contextual things that I've already gone through with you. Um, in terms of James I, the king who came to the throne in 1603, and his belief in the supernatural and his belief in witchcraft as well. Uh, we also had looked at exactly about the nature of Macbeth and how he actually is going on to, to see his wife having sent her sent a letter. And I just wanted to quickly cover this idea about Elizabethan women. It was very much regarded, even though you have Elizabeth I on the throne, who is a very, very powerful woman. If you think about what her father, Henry VIII, and all the issues that he had in terms of the thing that he's infamous for, in his six wives and so on, the main reason why he did that was, yes, because he liked Anne Boleyn rather than his wife Catherine of Aragon initially. Um, yes, he might have had some issues with religion in terms of gaining money from the monasteries and things like that, what we call the English Reformation. But the main reason why he'd done it is because he wanted a son. Um, because even though Mary Tudor, uh, his daughter with Catherine of Aragon, and Elizabeth I, his daughter, with Anne Boleyn were older, it was his son, Edward, who came to the throne before them. He died young, and so Mary took the throne, and when she dies, Elizabeth takes take the throne in 1558. Um, so this is very much about a male-dominated society. The power was, generally speaking, with men. And certainly in official roles in society, as I say here, women's roles tend to be somewhat peripheral. And by that, I mean they didn't make decisions. 
And this would have shocked a, an Elizabethan audience, or at least a Jacobean, which means James audience. Why? Because when we actually meet Lady Macbeth, she is an incredibly strong, domineering character. And I'll show you how that's demonstrated where later on in the scene she meets with her husband Macbeth, who returns from Duncan's court. Okay? Just by way of illustration to you as well, um, these are some pictures of various adaptations and productions of the play. And they might give you some idea about ideas and themes which surround this particular character. And obviously, as I said before, you can pause this whenever you like. You can actually look at the previous slide, look at this one as well, and get some ideas about the character and the nature of her villainy. Because if you remember, this is all about how is she a villain? Is she more of a villain or villainess? compared to Richard III, okay? So very, very famously, there is this picture with Lady Macbeth with blood on her hands, literally blood on her hands. Also metaphorically, blood on her hands, guilt on her hands. And it's something that she finds quite difficult to deal with, okay? Very, very common image of her is this rather striking, very witch-like looking woman in her, in her colouring and the darkness and so on. In fact, she's holding these knives there. She is absolutely instrumental in what happens in the narrative of this play, and initially more so than her husband. But she sh does show elements of conscience very much at the end of the play, in the foil, Act 5, Scene 1, but glimpses of them at the beginning. Okay, and what she has to do to overcome them, we will look at. This image here in a recent production of it, you can see that she is meant to be quite witch-like. And there's a big question, we look at some of the language that comes up in Act 1, Scene 5, there's a big question, is she actually the fourth witch? Is she somehow somebody who is somehow a follower of witchcraft, just like the Three Weird Sisters? Very, these two are very similar, and you can see from body language here what she sees her role as with her husband, and we'll look at this in a moment. Macbeth, initially, is somebody who is procrastinating. And remember what I said about these themes and ideas which are motifs in a number of Shakespeare's plays? And we've looked at that with Richard III, this idea of the man and the king, the idea of someone having villainous tendencies but having some heroic traits. And this one, you've got a hero, initially in Macbeth, who has got some villainous traits. But very much he is somebody, and by when someone procrastinates, they don't come to a decision. And he has got, even though this ambition is in his mind and it's taken hold, he also is really weighing that up all the time about what he should do. His loyalty should be to the king. And even though he wants the throne himself, and even though the witches have said, you will become king, just like you became Thane of Cawdor, actually, the good man within him says, no, I shouldn't be doing this. And you can almost see that in his face. Lady Macbeth, very similar faces here, is one who's persuading him all the time. Chastise thee with the valour of my tongue, is what she says. Okay? And again, there's that sense of persuasion here, whispering in his ear. Okay? And, he, and again, it's another motif, poison in the ear. The way that old Hamlet is killed in that play is poison in his ear, which is symbolic of words. The next villain we're going to look at is called Iago who is Othello's best friend, is always whispering in his ear, poisoning his mind. And you see very much as images that she does here. She is a beautiful woman, and she uses that uh, to manipulate her husband, and plays on particular sort of tendencies. And again, this is something I said, very much the first presentation I did for you guys on Richard III. This is all about humanity. This is all about the... the, the popularity and the longevity and the endurance of Shakespeare is not because it's just about the stories which are good stories, not just because it's about the language which is amazing language, not just because it's good drama, it's good play, but it's about people and it's about people and their natural characteristics and actually that does not change in the same way that ambition does not change over the centuries nor does the wife's power over her husband change over the centuries in the way that she persuades him. This one here is a really, really famous image of Lady Macbeth. You can't really see it very clearly, but there's almost a, her eyes that she is possessed there. 
And it's almost like she too has become somebody else. And there's that motif that comes up again and again. Macbeth, if you remember, says about the Thane of Cawdor, do not dress me in borrowed robes. It's about disguises. And it's very much a case here that she too has to put on a disguise to toughen herself up, to steer herself for what she has to do. The big question with her is, and this again is the beauty of Shakespeare, there are no definitive answers. We do not know why Lady Macbeth acts the way that she does, why she is so enthusiastic, so zealous for her husband to get the throne. Is it because she loves him? Is it because there's other emotions there? Is it guilt? Is it she's just evil? I don't think it is the last of those. But again, this is all about you making judgments as well. Okay. So have a look at those pictures and see what you can make of her as a character. Right. Now, this is the letter. This starts off Act 1, Scene 5. This is the letter that Macbeth sends to his wife. Um, and both the speeches that I'll go through today and that letter will be put on a system by, if they haven't been already, by Miss Panu and uh, Miss Mustafa for you to annotate. And so when I go through these, you can refer to them as well. Okay? So just looking at that letter, Macbeth writes, They met me on the day of success, and I've learned by the perfectest report they had more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves into air into which they vanished. While I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, and missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cordor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me, and referred me to the coming of the time with Hail King that shall be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner in greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing of being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart, and farewell. Okay, so he's essentially reporting to her what has happened. But there should be some standout things in that. So we're really going to annotate just a few points of this. They is obviously the three witches. They met me on the day of success. Now, ask yourselves, it can just be easy for me just to tell you these things, but as we're going through this, why was it a day of success for Macbeth? And obviously this is to do with the victory in battle. Or, in this case, as you know, the victory in battles. The fact he beats MacDonald, first of all, and then he beats Sweno, King of Norway, and the Thane of Cordor. But it's also successful for him in other reasons. And again, it's about the unsaid here. And I've learned by the perfectest report, they have more in them than mortal knowledge. Now, mortal is to do with humans. So what is he saying? They have more in them than simple human knowledge. And when we read the list of those powers that witches might have, what was among them? The power of prophecy. And what is it that they predicted, prophesied would happen, that did happen? Was him becoming the Thane of Cornwall. Okay? So he says that they have supernatural knowledge. Knowledge of the future. Okay? What I've burned in desire to question them further, and of course, the use of that burn there is almost an admission that he gets carried away. His passions are heightened by this. His ambition is suddenly starting to burn within him. And once that fire is started, it's a very, very difficult one to put out. What I've burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves into air into which they vanished. So they go. And whilst I stood wrapped, and we have that word there again, Bancro uses it about him, he uses it about himself. He was wrapped with it, he's overcome, he's literally wrapped up by this, by ambition. I came wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives, messengers from the king, who all held me Thane of Cordor, by which title before the weird sisters saluted me, and referred to the coming of the time of Hail King that shall be! Exclamation mark. He's excited by this. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner in greatness. Now this is a very, you know, well-known part of this particular letter. Macbeth is a powerful man. Macbeth is the decision maker. We said that, that in terms of the way that the genders were, going back to Elizabethan and Jacobean times. But he called her my dearest partner in greatness. Dearest 
He loves her. He very much loves her at the beginning. And one of the most amazing speeches in the whole of Shakespeare, in my opinion, comes right at the end of the play, when what's happened to Lady Macbeth happens. And does he still love her then? Well, he's become somewhat numbed by it. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. But at the beginning of the play, he loves her dearly. And he also sees her as his dearest partner of greatness. That thou might not lose the dues of rejoicing of being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. Promised to Macbeth is kingship. Therefore, promised to Lady Macbeth is becoming queen. Does she want it for herself? Does she simply want it for her husband? Are there other reasons there that she feels as though that she has to justify something in terms of contributing to her husband's greatness? And there's a question in this about whether she is unable to give him an heir, to give him a child. So she has to sort of justify her role by being this other thing to him, this person who pushes him to fulfil his ambition and to fulfil his potential. And then he says, lay it to thy heart and farewell, so keep it secret. Now, if you are a director, if you're an actor when it comes to Shakespeare, I've said before that stage direction in Shakespeare tends to be something which is quite vague. But equally Shakespeare is quite vague about how he suggests particular roles, characters are played. We can be quite clear about certain things, but over the centuries that this particular play has been put on, Lady Macbeth is generally speaking played as quite a villain. Macbeth is obviously a villain as well, but it's a strange dynamic between them. We're not absolutely certain about Macbeth still, what he's going to do. Lady Macbeth, however, the first words that she says in the play, she makes it absolutely clear what her intentions are, and absolutely clear what she thinks of her husband, and therefore what she's got to do here. She says, and remember, at the beginning of the play, he is Thane of Glamis, he becomes Thane of Cawdor, he is not yet king. And she says, no Scottish accent, Glamis thou art, you are Thane of Glamis, and Cawdor. Okay, that's fact. But then she says, and shalt be what thou art promised. There is no argument in her mind, you will be shall it be it is inevitable is it because she has some link with the witches we don't know the room I said right at the beginning of act one scene one there is an inevitability this now fate is taking control shall it be what thou art promised by the witches but then she says there's something about your character she knows her husband's not necessarily his weaknesses but his sensitivities, his loyalties, those good things about his character. And she sees them as weak. And it's a sorry indictment that certain characteristics are regarded as weakness. Yet I do fear thy nature, your character. It is too full of the milk of human kindness. Now if you think in terms of symbolism, something that represents something else, if you think of what is pure and good, and nurturing and all those positive things she sums up in this symbol of milk purity in terms of the whiteness of it and the milk obviously that a mother would give and immediately this is why there is a sort of idea that you know one of her issues is that she hasn't been able to give her husband a child is because she constantly and very quickly refers to this image of motherhood a mother giving her child milk and there's no kinder thing, there's no purer thing that can be done than the mother trying to nourish her own child with her own milk. And she's saying that Macbeth, her husband, this man who we know is a violent warrior, is too full of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Well, what's the, what do you mean by the nearest way? If his objective is to get the throne, and there is Duncan, there is Malcolm, and Donalbane, the nearest way, the quickest way, for him to get the throne is to kill all those three men. But she says he's too kind to do that. He is too decent and loyal and pure of heart to do that. 
the nearest is the quickest way. She says, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition. She said, you are ambitious, you want to be great, you want to be king, you want to do those things, but without the illness should attend it. But you're not willing to do those things it takes to do it. Just let me check again. What thou wouldst highly, the thing that you want most highly, and what does he want more than anything else? That crown. That which thou holily. You would go about it the right way. Holily, you'd go about it the godly way. Divine right. You'd wait for Duncan to die, and if it came about that there was a thing where Donald Bain and Malcolm happened to die as well, and then it was that you were somehow next in line by being the next strongest successor, then that's the way you'd go about doing it. You're not going to kill people in order to get there. You wouldn't play false, you wouldn't be devious, and yet would wrongly win. But you wouldn't do the thing yourself, but if it happened that those three men died, you'd be happy to benefit from it. Thou wouldst have great glance, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou wilt have it. You don't have that part of you that's really says, if I want this, I have got to do something about it. He hasn't got, innately, in his heart, what Richard III had. Which is, Richard III had lots of maybe redemptive, redeeming traits of his character, bravery and that sort of thing. He was very coldly objective about what he needed to do to get stuff. But Macbeth doesn't have that. His is always tempered, outweighed by his goodness, that milk of human kindness. And his wife is aware of that. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, the wishes should be undone. Hie thee hither. Now she's saying, I don't want it that these ideas about why you can't do this take hold of you. She doesn't want it to be that actually, even though it's clear in his letter that there is ambition there, burning in desire, wrapped in it and all that sort of thing, that by the time he gets to her, back at their home castle, that she, he has somehow persuaded himself not to do anything. So she says, hi thee here, get you here. Get to me now so I can start influencing you. I can start speaking to you. That I may pour mine spirits in thine ear. Now immediately she's saying that I need to be telling you things. The fact is, spirits... Is it again that she is somehow linked to the witches? That just like Macbeth is under the influence of the witches in Act 1, Scene 1 and their spell, remember his first word, so foul and fair a day I have not seen, is a repetition of their words, fair is foul and foul is fair. Is he under the influence of them? Is she under the influence of them? Is she wanting to influence him by whispering spirits and things in his ear about what he must do? And chastised with the valour of my tongue, what she says to him. Okay. All that impedes thee from the golden round. Everything impedes, stops, the golden round is the crown. So everything that is stopping you in your mind from getting the crown, I need to actually dissuade you about. I need to use my tongue, the words I've got, whispering things in your ear and telling you what to do and what not to do. Which fate, she's aware of it, and the metaphysical, the witches, they doth seem to have crowned thee with all. Fate has already given you the crown. The witches say that. All hail Macbeth shalt be king hereafter. Shalt be king hereafter. Shalt. And she's repeating those witches' words as well. And we can see from that Act 1, Scene 1, this now filtering down throughout the play the power of the witches and their influence on the characters. Okay? Now, what does she do next? something even more extreme than she's already just done. So there she goes, up onto the battlements of her castle. She says her castle, my battlements. And even though she just said that she was going to influence her husband, she says, 
The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Duncan comes to her castle. She doesn't say it is Macbeth's castle. My battlements. This is my place. And then she does something extreme. She does something that would have absolutely shocked an Elizabethan Jacobean audience. She, the potential future queen, and remember, the new king has just come from Scotland, she, the future queen of Scotland, calls on what? She calls on the spirits of hell, the spirits of darkness, to help her. Now this, the fact that she has to do this, suggests to us not only might she be a witch herself, but secondly, that she has a conscience. She